Welcome to our first session of our Accelerating Africa webinar series, where we'll be talking about advancing ICT for development, for sustainability, and impacting smaller land farmers across Africa. My name is uh, Christian Mabindu. I'm in charge of innovation uh, at cropping technologies across Africa, Latin America, and the Middle East. So as cropping, uh, we are a technology company providing farming solutions to the entire agricultural ecosystem, where we lead different actors in the agricultural ecosystem, providing solutions to some of the challenges they face in their day-to-day -day activities. Our solutions help increase efficiency, increase farmer productivity, promote climate smart and sustainable agriculture. So thank you everyone who has joined us on this webinar and we'd like to uh, quickly uh, introduce our panel of uh, panelists. So once again, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, so a brief introduction of uh, some of the panelists that we have uh, as part of today's uh, webinar. So we have Dr. Francis Aminu, who is a Director uh, for Health and Nutrition at uh, Aliko Dangote uh, Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Aminu, for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, Jacqueline Jonjo was not able to join us today uh, because of work-related uh, commitments. We also have uh, Mr. Lloyd DePage, who is a senior advisor for agriculture and uh, food investment in Africa at the Tony Blair Institute. We also have Vanessa Adams, uh, vice president and strategic partnerships and chief of party at AGRA. We also have Victor Mugo, our regional, who is a regional coordinator at uh, uh, Nourishing, uh, Nourishing Africa in charge of the East Africa region. So just to set the pace uh, for today's uh, agenda and uh, the theme where it is about um, advancing ICT development for sustainability and uh, impacting smaller farmers across Africa. Uh, so agriculture has been uh, a big food, uh, footprint. Uh, agriculture has a big footprint in Africa, African social and economic uh, sectors. According to the World Bank, the sector employs more than 60% of the population, effectively contributing to more than 25% of Africa's GDP. The sector provides employment to about two-thirds of Africa's working population, yet the sector, uh, sector's fully potential remains largely untapped. Africa has a big agricultural potential, unlocking, and unlocking it requires practical, on-the-ground efforts and innovative solutions. Given the continent's diversity, a winning strategy for stakeholders is to address the challenges faced by the farmers. The challenges uh, facing the sector remain largely the same, but the severity varies from country to country. Co common cross-cutting challenges include use of outdated uh, farming methods and uh, tools, uh, basically not using mechanization, limited professional agronomic training, unpredictable climate patterns, access to agri-input, and above all, lack of technology adoption across the continent. There is a consensus among African agri stakeholders that it is possible to achieve food security in Africa if the use of modern farming and food production technologies is accelerated. Smallholder farmers are the majority and they, they play a primary role in the production of food for their own consumption and also sustenance. Encouraging the use of research data innovations and technology in agriculture will unlock Africa's potential towards food security and will lead to the advancement of sustainable practices and jobs creation in the sector. It will also encourage development of a data-driven policy framework. Stakeholders, uh, stakeholder institutions can leverage ICT to predict growing patterns, hence determining the type of crops to plant at any given time. Estimate the crop health 
water stress and yield in near real time. ICT will improve the value chain by providing analytical data to support decision making at all levels of the sector. Information sharing, analytics, tracking and traceability, access to markets, uh, increased product, uh, productivity and finance are the key benefits derived from using agriculture uh, in uh, agri-tech. So just to set the stage, uh, as part of this uh, webinar series, uh, some of the things that we want to uh, achieve out of this is to discuss and uh, agree on how we can be able to increase productivity for, for catalyzing uh, ICT for development. Uh, that is the use of technology to drive socioeconomic development across Africa. Uh, advocate uh, for quick acceptance and adoption of uh, new technologies. Use market research and data analytics to boost capital flows to the agricultural sector. And also uh, how to adopt climate smart agriculture as a strategy across Africa. So as we uh, start, uh, before we start and go on, we like to know where you are joining us from. Uh, so we like to know um, from the audience, uh, from which country are you joining us from? So you can you can just go to the to the chat session of uh, the application. Uh, kindly let us know from which country uh, you are joining us from. I believe we have participants from over 23 countries across Africa and even other countries uh, across the globe. So just please let us know from which country you you are joining us from. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and to our participants, we'd like to uh, introduce our panelists uh, for the day. So I start with the Dr. Francis Aminu, uh, who is from Aliko Dangote Foundation, based out of Nigeria. Uh, Dr. Aminu is a development nutritionist, a nutrition specialist with more than 20 years of experience in program uh, management and organizational development in the area of food security and nutrition maternal and child health, sustainable agriculture, reproductive health, environment and gender analysis. Dr. Aminu has worked with various stakeholders, including government officials, donor agencies, development partners, civil society actors, and clients with in-depth and has in-depth knowledge of the political, economic, and sociocultural characteristics of Nigeria and some of the countries across Africa. He has a PhD in human nutrition, from the University of uh, Ibadan, a postgraduate diploma in public administration from uh, Polytechnic in Ibadan, and a master's in human nutrition and a bachelor of science in biochemistry from the University of uh, Ibadan. He's also a fellow of the Leadership for Environment and Development, a subsidiary of Rockefeller Foundation in New York, a grantee and fellow of the Fund for Leadership Development, and uh, is an award of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, uh, Chicago, USA. He has a thorough understanding of the development issues in Africa, regionally and globally. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Aminu, for joining us, and would like to um, request you to give your opening remarks and your thoughts on the discussion and the topic for the day. Welcome, Dr. Aminu. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity, uh, especially for the first time uh, I had a cross uh, across the path of uh, uh, cropping uh, technology. I think since then I've really appreciated what you are doing and how this is very, very important. But again, from the background that we have 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, which has given us a framework to eliminate poverty as well as achieve sustainable food security, because these are the two key areas that will always affect our environment, that will always affect our social life, and as well as our economic life. So, and when you look at this, a significant part of the efforts to meet those commitments uh, should definitely be focused in the rural uh, areas of the developing world, uh, especially where we have 70% of the world's extremely poor people where they live including most of the hungry of the world, which we know. And we know to what extent, even with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Deve Development, um, despite that, we're still lagging behind in Africa as part to meet some of those uh, uh, kind of uh, goals that were set and that we had a commitment you know, to really achieving. 
Uh, and when we improve the rural people's livelihoods, and especially the smallholders, uh, their capacities is a central element in ending hunger, because that's the beginning of that. And then achieving food security and improved nutrition and promoting sustainable agriculture. This is very, very critical. However, there is an ample empirical evidence uh, showing that the use of ICT for development, ICT 4, 4D, can produce better results in the area of agricultural development. There's no doubt about that. And several publications have even alluded to that, looking at the role of ICT in Africa uh, uh, and, and, and some specific countries where they are being used, and which clearly summarizes the role of ICT in agriculture that says, and I quote, ICTs play a, a significant role in the country development and the strategic application of ICTs to the agricultural sector. It offers the best opportunity for economic and uh, poverty alleviation. This is very, very important. And when we look at that, it shows that in Africa, we need to look forward towards adopting ICT, but we have to take into cognizance the social, cultural aspect of our lives, you know, and uh, which I, I may buttress later what happened with my experience uh, from dealing with the use of ICT and then the adoption rate and then how fast it's really our lives now depend on the use of ICT. But again, when you look at that, we need to make this exclusive in terms of what we are promoting. It has to be sustainable, it has to be inclusive, and it has to be form of rural transformation in nature because we have to transform our rural areas. We can't just continue to use ICT in the urban areas alone, but where we are having the bulk of the food production and then the agriculture, then ICTs offer opportunities for both the private the public and the social institutions to work on sustainable, productive, and profitable, and even inclusive partnerships to expand the services and then to make them accessible and affordable for those who will definitely need them. This is very, very important and uh, which we really need to consider in all that we do uh, uh, in terms of how do we push forward this and make uh, ICT available. And in, in conclusion, I just want to mention here that for us to be able to realize those sustainable development goals that were set for Africa, which I mentioned earlier on that we are lagging, there is really a need to go beyond just uh, talking about it, but mainstreaming them into our national development strategies our various economic growth strategies and socio-economic development strategies. They are really uh, required that we need to put those things in, in that uh, kind of uh, uh, format to be able to achieve what we need to achieve with that. And in, in lieu of this, uh, I would just want to say uh, ICTs are very, very uh, important, you know, in our modern kind of life in terms of how we can adopt and then use these in such a way that they are productive, they are profitable, and then they are able to help in generating more employment. And then with good regulations in place, the abuse of it will definitely be reduced. So thank you so much for this opportunity of uh, actually inviting me to be part of these discussions. I realize I have a lot to learn from others as well. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Aminu, really appreciate your input. Um, and um, it's definitely uh, worth noting that, uh, you know, like you said, it's important to adopt uh, ICT uh, for Africa to be able to accelerate towards uh, achieving uh, of the global uh, SDGs. I would like to uh, uh, invite our next panelist, uh, Mr. Lloyd DePage, uh, Senior Advisor for Agriculture and Food Investments at the Tony Blair uh, Institute. Uh, Lloyd has extensive background in agribusiness, sustainable development, uh, ecosystem services, livestock, and food uh, value chains, including vertical integrated production, investments, uh, investments and investment uh, environment, 
agri-tech, uh, food technology, um, and also has extensive leadership and management experience in international business, uh, farming, uh, agricultural investment, government, and regulatory policy, uh, including uh, public-private partnerships, rural and ecosystem development in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lloyd Alipage, for joining us. I also want to give you this, this opportunity to uh, give your opening remarks and your input uh, towards our, our topic for the day. Welcome, Lloyd. Thank you. Uh, just a sound check. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, very good. Thank you, and and thank you, Cropin, for for this excellent uh, opportunity to to have a discussion on this uh, this topic. And thank you for the participants and attendees that are uh, here today. First, uh, I'd just like to talk a little bit about the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. Uh, Tony Blair Institute for Global Change delivers innovative and practical policy solutions, and we provide advisory services for governments and leaders across Africa in many other areas. Our mission is to support leaders and governments to build open, inclusive, and prosperous societies, uh, and to do so in a, in a global context, in a global world. We have experts in our global government advisory team, in which uh, the, the team that I work with, that support countries and their leaders to turn their vision for development into reality through effective government, trade, and investment. And then we have a policy futures team, which delivers analysis and practical policy advice on issues, and a tech for development team that seeks innovation and technology solutions for health and agriculture and beyond. We provide long-term embedded advice and implementation support to presidents, prime ministers, key ministries, development agencies on how to prioritize, develop policy and strategy, plan and use performance management systems to ensure the delivery of government priorities. In agriculture, and in particular in Africa, uh, we are working in over 14 countries, um, up from just about a handful of, uh, a handful three or four years ago. Uh, we built a strong credibility as trusted advisors with African governments and key development partners. And here in agriculture and food systems, we believe it is a key responsibility of government to develop and support inclusive, responsive, and resilient market systems that provide rapid income growth for the majority of farmers and provide a catalyst for the private sector. Agriculture and food systems transformation will only happen through sustained government and leadership focus to facilitate the value chain in the private sector. And our vision is to equip leaders to develop on economic development and industrialization through accelerated transformation of agriculture and food systems, which is the foundation and engine for growth. To do so, we seek to help governments to accelerate scalable transformational change across key and strategic value chains, not only limited to crop production, but also beyond into uh, manufacturing, processing, uh, and, and ultimately uh, into consumer hands. We apply a, an ecosystems approach anchored to the government leadership and working across multiple ministries and with public and, and private actors, as well as the civil society. We still believe that the government plays a crucial role in enabling inclusive agri-markets. Now through the topic today, among other interventions, we believe strongly that innovation in advanced data and processing technology is fundamental to accelerate agriculture and food systems transformation in Africa. We believe that value chain digitalization and advanced agriculture and food systems data flows is critical to achieve that end. National and regional agri-food data hubs offer promise as a part of that key solution. And when we talk about uh, agri-food data hubs, first, we believe that they are key for stimulating a country's success to advance innovation. The massive data sets required to develop highly accurate, precise, and customized digital ag services presents a massive barrier to entry for innovation and investment. Governments are well positioned to solve for this and to make large scale ag data available to stimulate the ag tech ecosystem in support of broad transformation agenda. Second, they are key for enabling climate smart agriculture and more sustainable and efficient production, which is very important, not only in Africa today, but also in the rest of the world. Improving yield in spite of climate change calls for a new class of services which leverage in-depth analysis of timely, accurate, granular, and large-scale data 
to enable evidence-based and data-driven decision-making, uh, and also to, to provide access to new innovations such as intelligent farming machinery and other innovation. Finally, we believe that data hubs are key for driving wider socioeconomic development. Targeting digital agriculture services on strategically important value chains will accelerate socioeconomic development. However, a systems approach is needed. Transformation impact will be limited without catalytic leadership of government in partnership with the private sector uh, to drive adoption and scale. And it must address financial services and inclusion, uh, something that our previous uh, speaker talked about, including access to data and easy to understand decision-making tools of that data for small farmers and, and SMEs, including women, youth, and marginalized groups. And then finally, country and value chain context is critical for mutual benefit and long-term viability. I look forward to uh, further discussion uh, on, on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, thank you for your input. Uh, very comprehensive uh, on uh, the role uh, that uh, TBI is uh, doing, working with governments to provide advisories um, to government officials uh, and also pushing for the use of technology for development in agriculture and also other sectors. Uh, thank you for that uh, input, uh, uh, Mr. Lepage. We really appreciate it. I also want to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Victor Mugo, who is a regional coordinator in East Africa uh, for Nourishing Africa. Uh, Victor is a farm developer that they use for the key transportation of food systems. Uh, Victor is a previous much of the specialist mobilizing a youth transition to climate resilient agriculture and agricultural entrepreneurship. He is a regional coordinator for Nourish Africa that the structures of support around agri food entrepreneurs through a digital membership and knowledge platform to enable agribusinesses to grow and scale. In need, he is responsible for membership recruitment, building strategic and collaborative partnerships and facilitating program implementation in East Africa. He's also the co-chair of the Youth Relations Group to the historic UN Food STEM Summit. Uh, Areta is a author of UNEP's Global Development of Youth Africa publication and a regular columnist in the business. He's the recipient of the President's Bolag Adelina Fellowship, the Yali Fellowship, and was also named as the Youth of the Year Agribusiness in 2020 and featured in the list of top 35 under 35 in Kenya. Thank you, Victor, for joining us and kindly give us your opinion and uh, your input in terms of uh, the. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're listening in from. Uh, really great to be here in this um, a great webinar, really, and with uh, such an illustrious. Uh, line of speakers. Uh, I'm really uh, happy and uh, delighted to be here. Um, so I, I really look at this topic on advancing ICTs for sustainability and smallholder uh, impact in agriculture is, is really an important topic, um, especially because, and I'll be speaking from a youth perspective, um, looking at my, my experience with the Climate Smart Agriculture Youth Network, uh, but also from Nourishing Africa, uh, which really work together with young people, um, young farmers to transition them to climate smart agriculture, uh, and then and Nourishing Africa to provide the structures of support to agribusinesses uh, so that they can be able to grow and scale. Um, and from a youth perspective, um, I really think ICT uh, can be a game changer in attracting young people towards uh, agriculture. Um, and I can think of three or four ways in which uh, this can be, but I'm, I'm going to be uh, making this uh, known to you even, even um, as we continue. Um, <clears throat> we did a small study um, at, at one of the universities in Nairobi um, and asked them to paint the first thing that comes to their mind once the word agriculture was mentioned. Um, and so we thought by asking them to do this kind of behavioral um, exercise, then we will get their um, thoughts the real thoughts of what young people are thinking about agriculture as it, as it is, uh, as it is uh, at the moment. Uh, and we asked um, students who are taking agricultural courses uh, to either write uh, or draw one cloud uh, or just um, paint the first thing that comes to their mind once the word agriculture is mentioned. And what they drew was really um, disheartening, especially from my own perspective. Uh, they drew a very old man, just showing that agriculture is not uh, for the old. Uh, is not for the young people, 
Um, and so we can see that uh, our food systems really have a great disconnect, especially with young people. Young people do not see themselves having a future in agriculture um, and do not see themselves making a living out of agriculture as it, uh, as it is at the moment. Um, then the other thing that we could see from all uh, the, the material that was painted and drawn um, and the white clouds that were there um, was that the old man was standing next to a grass touch hat. Uh, which is, of course, a symbol of poverty in, in the African uh, setup. Um, so agriculture has been symbolized as a, a way to transfer generational poverty. So our parents were poor because they were, get, they, they were in agriculture. And now that um, once we get into agriculture, then uh, this is what we see for ourselves, uh, really um, uh, uh, poverty. Um, uh, and the other thing that I could see uh, and we could see from all the material was that the um, old man was standing, uh, was holding a garden hoe, uh, which is commonly known in East Africa as a djembe, um, and showing that there's very little space for innovation, uh, little space for mechanization, a uh, little space of digitalization of the whole agricultural value chain. Um, and lastly, um, uh, the, the man was standing uh, under the scorching sun, just showing that agriculture is difficult, is manual, is backbreaking, um, and, and the likes. And I really want to concentrate on uh, this aspect, where young people think that agriculture really has not moved um, with the current pace of technological innovation. So we can see um, a, a, an array of uh, digital technologies um, and that are really revolutionizing uh, all other sectors, the health sector, uh, the finance sector, um, very many sectors, but this uh, has not really come into real fruition uh, in the agricultural sector. Uh, and so I think this webinar is really critical so that we can think about, uh, not only just from a smallholder farmer's perspective, let us think about the future of young people, or uh, the future of uh, the agricultural food systems, which is uh, within the young people, and how can we use um, really data, technology, uh, innovation to attract young people uh, into agriculture. So looking forward to uh, what uh, the other panelists will say and then to the other questions. So thanks so much uh, for this question. That we will be able to uh, feel have, that we really need to adopt ICT uh, in order to and also to um, attract the, the youth into agriculture. How do we involve, for us to be able to feed Africa, we need to involve the youth more in agriculture. We need to change the narrative about agriculture from using all technologies uh, to also thinking about agriculture as a business. Thank you, Victor. I would like to invite our next panelist, uh, who is um, Vanessa Adams uh, from AGRA. She is a VP Strategic Partnerships at COP Partnership for Inclusive Agricultural Transformation in Africa. Uh, Vanessa has over 25 years of professional experience, including with uh, Fortune 500 companies in the US. She has 18 years experience working in 29 African countries with governments, businesses, and farmer cooperatives to increase productivity, meet buyer specifications, access finance, and com compete in international markets. She partners with governments, donors, and businesses to develop and implement strategies with, uh, which increase product, uh, productivity and international trade, expand investments, improve business environments, access financial services, as well as reduce constraints to economic growth. Vanessa currently manages USAID strategic partnerships, digital agriculture, gender and inclusion, uh, implementing a 500, meter, a 500 million USD strategy, partnership for inclusive agricultural transformation in, in Africa. Previously, she led a 70 million plus US, USD projects with multicultural teams facilitated over 300 million in exports, uh, facilitated over 300 million uh, USD in exports from Africa and catalyzed over $70 million in investments as well as over $140 million in credit. She contributed to the foundation of three, three Pan-African NGOs, including the Africa Cashew Alliance, Borderless Alliance, and Global Share Alliance, as well as initiating the Women in Agri Business Leadership Network in Ethiopia. Thank you, Vanessa, uh, Vanessa for joining us. We'll also like you to give your opening uh, uh, remarks and also your input on the topic for the day. And you can also uh, make your presentation about uh, what Agra is doing in partnership with cropping. Thank you, Vanessa, and are uh, most welcome.
I'm kind of intimidated by your reading of my entire CV. I'm not really sure uh, how to follow on that uh, wonderful introduction, but thank you so much. And um, as Lloyd said, this is a great panel. We could probably speak for a week on these important topics that you're um, inciting here. Uh, I think um, uh, I, I love what Victor was just saying about perceptions uh, versus realities. And, and this is really something which plagues the whole industry in terms of food and agriculture and Africa. Uh, the perceptions of what's possible on the continent, um, we're, we're, we're hounded by um, the, the, the perception of famines and uh, constant crises. And I think the programming and the funding which um, Africa has been able to catalyze has been um, building on uh, perceptions and this is something which we really um, are looking to change and change the conversation. Um, I've been given access to show my screen, uh, but I'm not sure if this is going to work. So we can't talk about digital technology without having technical glitches, right? Um, I'm not sure. I'm going to just decline uh, because I don't know how, to, how this works. Oh, show your screen. Let me just say a few things, and then I'll see if I can put my presentation up. Um, I want to say this. This year, 2021, is the year of the Food System Summit. It's the year of um, nine harvests remaining till we reach the so-called um, 2030 Agenda, Sustainable Development Goals. It's also a critical um, uh, year in terms of the conversation changing on climate change uh, and climate adaptation, which is driving a lot of the, 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 the programming and strategies. Um, and yet at the same time, as you all know, Agra was founded to speak to the smaller farmer needs, um, whether it be policy changes, as Lloyd's uh, well, well described, um, from top-down strategic level policy requirements, whether it be, as you've mentioned, um, Christian, the, the criticality of businesses and sustainable investments on the continent, or in the end, um, how farmers receive, and you can hear my chickens in the background contributing to the conversation, but you know, how are we changing the, the, the rural economy in a way that farming becomes appealing, it becomes desirable, and rather than something people are running from. And uh, there was a great um, Nigerian singer who, who was trying to, to make farming even more sexy, right? Singing about the cocoa farmer and how you know, the cocoa farmer uh, used to be considered something that you dreaded, and yet, you know, you could actually make money being a farmer. You know what I'm talking about, Francis. I can see you laughing. So the, the, the idea here is that we do want to change perception and reality simultaneously. And we've been speaking, as you all know, through the African Green Revolution um, Summit, uh, about investing in Africa and investing in the last mile and investing in a sustainable and viable way where smallholders economies can be transformed for the long term. And that means a lot of things. And we've seen in COVID where markets are completely disrupted, uh, disrupted by, by borders being closed, disrupted by not knowing, you know, um, how much food stocks are available in countries, disrupted by huge political will moving into the African continental free trade area and opening regional markets on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, long lines of trucks stuck at borders because we didn't have the technology to get them through fast enough and get some COVID testing done quickly enough. So we're, we're really in a, in a challenging um, a context where the criticality and increased volatility of our environment is also pushing us towards a digitization and um, towards integrated solutions. And that's what the Food System Summit, which has just concluded in New York, and um, which many of us uh, heard or contributed in some way to the conversation on changing and transforming food systems sustainably through um, increased commitments, through uh, recognition that um, challenges on consumption patterns like nutrition, uh, contribute in, 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 in integrated uh, and holistic ways to productivity and to um, obesity and to the cost of, uh, uh, of country um, ec economies. And so what we've seen, and thankfully there was a huge uh, political will, uh, about 95 heads of state, um, over 125 
countries submitted pathways that came out of national dialogues to commit towards new and, and revitalizing thinking around food systems. And that includes agriculture, and that includes digital platforms, and that includes traceability, that includes food safety. And, you know, people who aren't in agriculture and food think this is incredibly complicated, right? If you're distributing condoms, you can count them. And you say, okay, this contributes to healthier people, and we know that there's going to be less uh, pandemics of AIDS and so forth, and let's distribute more condoms. Super easy equation, just distribute, count, and you're happy, go home. If you're doing injections and, you know, thank God there are more COVID vaccinations coming through, but it, you know exactly the count in each country, what's going through. But when COVID hit and we said, okay, how much food do we have on hand in every country in Africa right now today? People turned around, looked around, scratched their heads. They got out pen and paper, started thinking, how am I going to do calling the field? We don't have the data. We don't have the information. We don't even know where to start counting. So some countries like Kenya have been doing fantastic work on farmer registrations and then ran into difficulties about, you know, the, 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 the sensitivity of personally identifiable data, which is, again, uh, uh, something which um, cell phone service providers have been, you know, uh, capitalizing on to increase their, their marketing and know their customers better. And yet we in agriculture, say, wait, how many farmers again? Can we go back out? Do we count individuals? How old are they, right, Victor? We argue, we say farmers are getting older and we say, well, are they really? When we do our statistics, they're actually averaging around 45, not 65. Okay, well, which farmers did you count in which countries, you know? So we are making it super complicated. Let's simplify um, what we're measuring. Let's, let's go back to the basics. You know, we need healthy diets. We know that it contributes to longevity. We know that we will. We want rural economies to be thriving. We want investors to come in and invest in food and agriculture and seeing this as, a, as actually a thriving marketplace. And that means more um, integrated platforms. It means more of the private sector being willing to take some of the long-term investment views, not getting a three-year, four-year return on investment that you get from property or you know some of the nice financial markets um, which are going crazy, right? So there's a lot of work to do. And again, when we work as we have been with, with each of you, um, but in particular uh, for last mile digitization through village-based advisors onto smallholder farmers, we have seen uptake of new technology at a crazy rapid pace. People say farmers don't want to change. That hasn't been our experience. If they have access to technology, they see the marketability of their products. If they can actually afford the technologies which are being um, made available to them, and they know how to use them, they are making changes at extremely rapid paces. And this is where uh, we actually, through the, the, this um, AGRF summit, uh, had over 20 participating um, ministers of agriculture. We had over 10 heads of state, and a, a really strong push and, and agreement on increased commitment towards increased budget for, for agriculture, towards um, increased attention to uh, the, the linkage, again, between uh, imports, what's coming from other countries, and local production, and regional markets. And this is where we really see huge potential going forward. So I'm muddling the questions a bit by saying that, for sure, the time is now. It, this is really time to start seeing these changes and taking the risks necessary and, and partnering um, as each of us are in the ecosystems at a national level, at regional levels, and continental levels. Um, because in the end, and you all see this, it's an it's extremely competitive environment, right? So much funding is going into Asia. There are twice as many or three times as many smallholder farmers in Asia. So people look at the numbers, um, look at the, the uptake of technology, and say, well, Africa will get there eventually. We'll see it, you know, but anyway. I remain optimistic, persistently optimistic, uh, and I really appreciate um, this uh, discussion and the conversation. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, thank you for staying optimistic on behalf of Africa. We are glad to see everyone is on board, including your chicken. Um, and we, you know, I know Agra has been at the heart of uh, speaking on behalf of our smallholder farmers. And uh, like you said, we need everyone 
um, on board. We need to make agriculture more appealing. We need ways and mechanisms to uh, deal with COVID, uh, you know, market disruptions like what has been co what was caused by COVID, uh, and we'll touch uh, some of these uh, later in the you know in, in the discussions. Uh, you also mentioned about uh, the commitments uh, made during the AGRF summit by different stockholders from the government to private sector, and uh, you know we we'll also want to have a discussion around the same um, later in the discussion. So thank you very much, uh, our panelists. So before we could move forward. I would like to have a quick poll uh, to our participants, uh, for the people who are uh, you know, joining us from different uh, corners of the globe. Uh, and we want to know, um, according to you and based on the region where you are based, uh, what are the, the biggest challenges that smallholder farmers uh, face in Africa? So I know, you know we'll have different challenges, maybe whether in the, in the east or south or north, central uh, or in the west, uh, but you know, the challenges are more or less the same. It's only that uh, you know they might vary from one region to the other. Uh, so there's a, a, a poll link that is coming up. Uh, kindly let us know um, which challenges uh, for people in your region are facing, uh, especially the smallholder farmers. So it's on your screen. Uh, so that is the, uh, the question. Yeah, so I can see the polls are coming in. Uh, so. We have access to finance at around 67%, access to extension services around 67% of the participants, access to markets 33%, access to mechanization around 33%. So keep uh, voting, keep uh, giving your feedback uh, before we we'll probably take a short 30 seconds break uh, before we can move to the next session as we wait for the participants to give in their input. So the polls are still coming in as we wait for the final uh, polls to come in. Uh, so I'd want to uh, for us to start the panel discussion with our panelists. Uh, once again, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so we have um, some general consensus on some of the challenges that we face. So these are questions that I will pose to all of you, uh, to all our panelists, and we'll probably start with you, Vanessa. Uh, so you mentioned about uh, you know Africa uh, and the SDG 2030 goals uh, you know that have been set for climate uh, action, zero hunger, and gender equality. So uh, given the current scenario, uh, do you believe we are aligned to accomplish the Africa SDG 2030 goals uh, set for climate action, zero hunger, and gender equality? If so, how could we fast track this progress to reach a desirable outcome? Did any of you see um, Amina Mohammed's Twitter uh, where she tweeted after last week's uh, Food System Summit, all of the men heads of state who presented simultaneous to all of the women heads of state who presented? So there were like nine women heads of state and, you know, like 80 men. And, and I think, you know, her point was uh, about what you're raising, which is about gender equality, right? You know we're so far away from gender equality we know that um, so i'm starting with the last one because it, there's a great visual and i hope um, some of you get a chance to you can go back through her tweets and see it in in like you know 10 seconds you get the point so clearly um and and i was not a feminist i swear i swear i wasn't a feminist but having lived in africa uh, the time i have and working in ethiopia and working with farmers and farmer field days and events, and you could see where um, you would send out invitations, invite people to participate, and you'd have less than 10% of women participating in farmer field days on a consistent basis, or showing up in trainings to do with agriculture, or you know, 15%. So at Agra, we've been very, very pleased to have actually almost 35% women's participation in the reach that we've done through village-based advisors and out to smallholder farmers. But 35%, think of that. I mean, that's a third rather than a half of what where we need to be. So on, on the gender equality question, I think we really have to be thinking about things differently uh, to reach the goals that we have. Some countries are much, much further along than others. In fact, some countries in Africa far outperform Europe or Asia, like Rwanda, in terms of parliamentarian representation, right? So there are highlights and, and, and um, absolutely best practices, and I think we need to learn and scale from some of those. Lloyd, you're probably 
we're better positioned to answer the details on, on that case study. But um, in terms of uh, um, uh, poverty uh, reduction or alleviation, absolutely we need to um, uh, 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 step up and, and scale what we know to be working. Uh, a friend of a great friend of ours, Julie Howard, um, started at some point saying, "We've done enough pilots. That's it. We don't want to see any more pilots. We want to see scale. We want to see impact." Uh, and and I saw her last week, and I, I appreciated again and reminded her how influential that that message really has been. I think in terms of programming and funding, and um, you know, uh, at Agora we've been extremely ambitious. In fact, we've been challenged for being so ambitious in terms of wanting to see scaled impact, right? And and again and again reiterating that it's not enough to to have. 10,000 farmers um, doing better and growing more. It's not enough to, to see a couple hundred um, agro-dealers. We need to see tens of thousands of agro-dealers, retailers distributing and linking supply chains. We wanna see uh, millions of smaller farmers using mechanization, not just a, a couple handfuls here and there who are working through different um, platforms. And and the same is true in terms of inputs. You know. Um, I, we had to speak last week again about why seeds matter, you know, and, and here we are talking about digitization, you know, and, and I love the, the title here, Ag Accelerating, Ag Accelerating Africa. The, the Ag Acceleration, seed technologies are accelerators. We know that, right? If you're planting old seeds and if you've done it in your own garden, you see how quickly the generational the gap in seeds produces less and less and less. So just that alone doubles, triples, quadruples yields, increases performance at such a high level that we just can't neglect the basics. And um, this is, you know, something which is kind of old news, right? We, this is nothing new. It's been done all around the world. And yet we still see people mitigating risk, not having access to the varieties that they need. And we see a lot of red tape and regulations. And so we've been working to streamline processes and procedures and, and expedite, digitize even um, the approved seeds, right? And, and so that people know if they have real seeds, if they have the right kind of seeds, if they can get access to it. So there's accelerators which have really been working and, and um, continue to work. And finally, I wanna come back to leadership, right? And Lloyd is gonna reiterate this, I'm sure, but everybody has made commitments. Uh, each government that we've worked with has committed to ag budgets, to um, uh, uh, you know, ag and nutrition agendas, and now to food systems. Um, those commitments are there. But when a, a minister of finance has to go and justify his budget to parliament and to the government, push comes to shove. You have all of your donors, and you know you're not meeting your 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 deliverables in terms of IMF and other financial agreements. Then what gets cut is definitely you know some of the critical. Um, budgeting and so it's really getting better at defending to to governments to stakeholders to constituencies um, not just during election year but year in year out why agriculture is really the core and the base of of economic uh, transformation uh, in Africa and and I think we can get to the 2030 goals if we continue to keep the pressure up and and measuring performance across the board thanks Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, very valid uh, points. Uh, you know, you mentioned about um, you know leadership uh, and working with the governments to make sure that uh, you know agriculture gets uh, a good share of the budget. Uh, you also spoke about um, sometimes being told that we are being too ambitious in our interventions and in our plans. Um, and of course, you also spoke about uh, need to st step up uh, to implement large-scale um, interventions, not just working with pilots anymore, uh, but it's time to scale. Uh, so Lloyd, I'll uh, go next to you. Uh, I know you have extensive um, knowledge and experience uh, working with governments and uh, provide, uh, providing advisories to government officials. And some of the things that uh, uh, Vanessa mentioned, uh, you know, she also mentioned about uh, Rwanda. I know you spent some time in Rwanda uh, through, your, uh, through your career. So I want to, you know, same question, but also uh, getting your inputs around, uh, you know, from where you sit 
as a Tony Blair Institute and working with the governments, uh, what do you think, uh, what more can be done to accelerate uh, the achieving of the Africa, the SDGs uh, 2030 goals? Yeah, thank you. And, and you know, Vanessa, has, 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 as always, has said things extremely well. And uh, uh, we had this saying, I, I spent most of my career in the private sector uh, before joining the Tony Blair Institute. And, um, you know, in the agricultural private sector, you have essentially in your career, you have 30 seasons to be able to make a difference, right? If you're, if you're lucky, you get a 30 year career. Um, I'm at towards the end of that already, but, um, you know, to, to Vanessa's point, we've got nine seasons left to make a difference before 2030. And so we are really keen to do things at a national scale. Uh, and to do so means that we have to have enlightened leadership. And that leadership means that, you know, all the way from, from cabinet, uh, from the president, from the cabinet, um, not just the minister of agriculture, the poor ministers of agriculture are overloaded with the tasks at hand. Agriculture is extremely complex, um, but so many other factors are related to that. And that sort of industrialization and, and you know, the, the whole value, value chain all the way from inputs, right mm -hmm. the way through, through production, all the way through to harvest, post-harvest handling, manufacturing, processing, and finally into the logistics and, and into the hands of, of the consumers at the end of the day, and in some cases, export. All of those factors need to be accounted for, that, that entire value chain. And, and sometimes the, the biggest barrier is not necessarily production, although there's still a lot of room to go there, but it is about you know, increasing uh, you know, the efficiency of the entire value chain. I would like to say that you know, across Africa, things are, are you know, on the agriculture productivity side, there's a lot of good progress. Right? I'd like to stress that we are making good progress. However, the problem is that we're not making progress fast enough. And the accelerating that rate of change, I think, is a fundamental thing that we need to, to do. Look at the rate of growth, not just the growth itself, but the rate of growth. And how can we increase? How can we get that hockey stick increase? Um, and we can't do that through experiments. We can't do that through uh, little pilots here and there. They're very important, yes. Uh, but we've done pilots for the 30 years of my career, we've done pilots. And we now need to get into the national scale. We need to really work with governments. You know, I challenge the private sector to come alongside government, help them to, to think big, help, you know, and, you, and please think big, private sector. Uh, you know, design or work together with governments to co-design uh, opportunities which might benefit the majority of, of farmers and, and the small farm, smallholder, uh, sorry, uh, small and medium enterprises around the farmer to benefit. That provides jobs, that provides, you know, gender equality, that provides, you know, many things in there that, that uh, are really driving the economy forward. But it is a case of leadership. Leadership also is about delivery. So delivering on, uh, you know, not only making the, the great strategies, great, you know, a lot of the countries that we see have fantastic strategies, but it's about delivering on that strategy. It's about making the impact and, and managing that project all the way through. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, very uh, good points about, you know, we have very good strategies, but it's about now execution and, uh, you know, scale going to national uh, wide um, projects where you know we no longer just get um, confined to the, to the pilots. Uh, so next, I would want to invite Dr. Francis Aminu uh, to also give uh, his uh, input on the same. Where, where you know, do you believe we are aligned to accomplishing the Africa SDG 2030 goals uh, that have been set by uh, Dr. Aminu? Yeah, thank you so much for for this, and I think. Uh, yeah, the, I think this the answer is really yes or no. But uh, yes, in the true sense that knowing fully well over the years, uh, the kind of agricultural uh, practices that we are involved with that are traditional, yes, may not take us that far without actually adopting some elements of uh, technology that will help us improve and like uh, Leo said, you know, when you look at the issue of uh, uh, post-harvest losses still happening, 
then this one will give one a cause for uh, a kind of concern that yes, at the end of the day, no, we won't be able to meet all this if we don't have that. But what I just want to ship in here is that the challenge that we're still faced with with agricultural sustainability, uh, they, they have to do more with things that are outside the realm of the powers of the farmers. And the country to which financial support or other type of support will reach out to them is it through political means that we need to really correct. Take, for instance, the issue of climate change that which is natural and which you know a uh, political class can really come together and fashion out a way out uh to read uh, you know redress that before they advise the farmers on where to go the issue of water scarcity that's really still ravaging the whole uh, african continent uh, lack of access to water for irrigation and purposes even for safe drinking water and then when you look at the impact on the whole environment, the degradation of the whole ecosystem services and biodiversity that are no longer there. And then consequently, the sharp rise in the cost of food, uh, agricultural inputs and energy. These are things that have to do with creating that financial crisis that will be hitting hard, you know, on the poor communities that they need external support to be able to do. So these are not there. And that's why one can easily say, yes, especially according to the recent report from the Sustainable Development Goal Center for Africa, which uh, our benefactor is a co-share of that center. I uh, mean, Alaji Aliko Dangote, from, uh, Dangote himself is a co-share with the uh, president of uh, uh, Rwanda, you know, in that center, uh, which still state that we are lagging behind. The continent is still lagging behind when you look at those aspects of uh, climate action, zero hunger, and then even issue of gender equality, you know, when you look at that. However, like I said, what I think the African continent needs to look at to be able to fast track this pro uh, the progress that we have made and then we have to still make to reach that desirable outcome, we be to go beyond domestication process, like I said earlier on, just mainstreaming the SDG into the national plans will not help. But we need to contextualize both the target and the indicators that we have set for each of those goals. We need to really do, uh, contextualize them in such a way that they go beyond the subnational and then be able to reach out. We will find out that majority of the farm, uh, 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 farm holders or farm families are those that are really affected by this issue of uh, climate change action and then zero hunger and then the gender equality that needs to be there. So that means we have to change from the conventional present to future that we are looking at to a kind of future to present because we have to take that future that we are looking at in sustainability is what should be happening now if we must get to that future. So we can't wait and say, it is still what we do, we want to fashion into future, but rather we have to fashion future into what we're doing. And that's the only way we can cascade uh, the 2030 agenda, SDG, you know, backward in such a way that it can benefit Africa and all its communities. That's what I have to contribute to that right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis Aminu. Uh, very good points. Um, and just to probably take your last point, uh, where you spoke about we need to uh, think futuristically for us to be able to achieve uh, those uh, 2030 SDGs. Uh, someone said that uh, the only way to uh, predict the future is to invent it right now. So basically what you're saying is uh, for us to be able to achieve the outcome that uh, we envision by 2030, we then need to invent it right now. We need to take action right now. Uh, thank you very uh, for that uh, input, uh, Dr. Francis Aminu. So I'll uh, pose the same question uh, to Victor, but with a slight change. Uh, so first thing is, do you believe that uh, we are aligned to accomplish the Africa SDG 2030 goals? Uh, and also, and above that, Victor, what role do the youth have to play in uh, for us, for Africa to achieve the 2030 SDG goals? 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris Pent, uh, for, for that question. Uh, I will be less civil with this answer um, and, and say uh, that will we get there? Uh, probably we will get there. But are we on track? We are definitely not on track. Um, there are very many reports that have come out to say that there are more hungry people in Africa right now than there was um, a few years ago. And so uh, what we are seeing is a digress uh, in especially the number of people who are going hungry. Uh, with the COVID pandemic, I see these numbers that have even uh, in increased. Um, and so um, we have about nine, nine, nine seasons uh, to make sure that there's change. Uh, and this then um, makes us uh, think that there needs to be skilled action. There needs to be accelerated action. Um, that one person going hungry is one too many, just one person. 253 million people uh, going hungry is, is, is absolutely chaos. Um, and we should not accept that. Uh, I, I think we are becoming too um, complacent uh, with the numbers. Uh, um, if it's uh, about 250 million, um, then it seems like a small number compared to the probably 1.2 billion people we have in Africa. But uh, if we look at it, if it's you who's going hungry, if it's your child who's going hungry, if it's your sister who's going hungry, then that's one too many. Uh, so we need to ensure that we can increase scale. So uh, I will say we are not on track, but probably with the kind of accelerated action, then we can be able to get there. Um, and there are two things that uh, I, I think that give me hope that we will get there. Um, and, and this might be quite simplistic. Um, one um, is the just concluded UN Food System Summit. Uh, and so for the first time, we can see really great cooperation. We can see galvanizing of ideas, galvanizing of uh, different constituencies. We can see uh, wanting to bring everyone on the table, governments, um, private sector, the civil society, young people, indigenous people, all together in one room to co-create solutions. Um, and, and we can see that this really is, is quite a great recipe for, uh, for change. Um, however, we can see that this is just um, uh, announcements. These are just commitments that have been made by governments. Uh, and so we really need to put our governments accountable and to hold our governments accountable to make sure uh, that we can be able to um, get there. Um, so the UN Food System Summit is something that gives me hope. Uh, uh, for, for a long time, I think there's been some laxity in this, but that galvanizing of ideas, that coming together uh, is really the recipe for change. And so uh, we can get there. Um, the second thing that gives me hope, uh, especially um, that we will get there, is uh, the young people. Um, and what we've seen, uh, especially in the last few years, is young people uh, are getting invested in agriculture. Young people are passionate about uh, agriculture. What we've seen um, is um, young people coming up with uh, innovative ideas. Uh, uh, they are the vanguards of innovation. Um, from our perspective at Nourishing Africa, uh, where we have about 1,250 uh, agri SMEs um, that we support on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, reaching over about 50,000 um, uh, stakeholders within the landscape. Uh, we've seen young people really rising to the challenge uh, and being uh, taking this challenge head on. Uh, and if they are provided with the structures of support, if they can get um, access to funding, access to information, um, uh, access to capacity building, um, and if they get this ecosystem of support, uh, then we can be able to get there and get there even, even faster. Um, and the last thing that I will say, um, although we have not even um, gotten there, um, is uh, the revision of the NDCs um, and, and the COP26, really. Um, so what we've seen is uh, climate change just being uh, moving from just an abstract topic um, and these heightened uh, discussions about climate change. Uh, right now, it's being mainstreamed in every aspect uh, of um, our, our programming. And so that is really great to see because climate change is not something that we hear about in the televisions. It's not something that we see um, from uh, our newspapers. It's something that we experience on a very day-to-day uh, -day basis. Um, I think Krista and, uh, and Vanessa, you'll agree with me uh, that here in Kenya, there's about uh, 1.4 million people who are going hungry because of an ongoing drought. Uh, we are just so lucky that yeah, it rained, but if this uh, was not mitigated, uh, uh, then it, it could really have caused a great challenge. Uh, you can also lay um, uh, uh, and confirm that there has been um, a locust crisis here in East Africa. All these things related to climate change. And so it's not something that we hear about or something that we, is happening uh, in Rome or in discussions um, in Glasgow. 
uh, it's something that we are experiencing here. Uh, and so I, I think with this heightening of um, uh, climate change uh, really as uh, something that we need to discuss and we can discuss and mainstream it in our everyday programming, uh, then this gives me hope that we will get there. So the UN Food System Summit, uh, the revision and the NDCs and the COP26, and especially the young people give me hope that we will get there uh, in due time. Thank you, Victor. Uh, thank you. And I, I, you know, you mentioned some important points about, uh, you know, the statistics are very saddening about the number of people who are going hungry across Africa and uh, the way we need to bring everyone on board to create solutions. Uh, and of course, holding our governments accountable and also mentioning about uh, what needs to be done to, you know, involve the youth more in agriculture uh, and for climate change, not just, uh, you know, something we read about or hear about, but something we're experiencing. Uh, so probably just uh, to our audience, uh, in case you have any questions as we continue with the panel discussions, uh, kindly type them in the, um, on the chat side, then we'll address them at the, at the end of the, uh, we have a Q&A uh, session. Uh, so if you have any questions, just kindly type it in the chat and we'll be able to answer your questions uh, at the end of the discussion. So I want to go back to our panelists uh, and I wanted to find out, um, and I'll start with you again, uh, Vanessa. I know Agra is uh, really involved in uh, funding a lot of development programs, especially uh, when it comes to interventions and uh, helping the small rural farmers. I uh, just wanted to find from you, how do you evaluate the sustainability of a development program and what criteria do you look at to identify a beneficiary? Okay, um, trick questions, right? So uh, let me start by talking about um, Agra's um, Piata partnership. Agra is actually uh, a convener and a co-partner with Gates Foundation Rockefeller, USAID, FCDO from the UK, and then the BMZ um, from the German government, German Development Cooperation. And we also, uh, as you all probably are aware, have funding um, over the years from IKEA Foundation, MasterCard, and some other uh, strategic funding partners um, like UNEP, EFAD, and so forth. The reason I'm mentioning this is because, you know, people might think Agra has its own money or, you know, if we're doing whatever we want. But it's, it's actually part of a strategy, which the strategy was 2017 to 2021. And now we're launching uh, into a 2030 strategy, a strategic period. And this is really critical because the, the, the way Agra worked, I think the way that people learned about Agra from the inception, when Kofi Annan did his call for a uniquely African green revolution to 2016, things evolved in a certain very technical way with Prog program focus into implementation in, in 18 different countries. Um, then we reduced our country footprint and worked through three pillars. One was the policy pillar and improving the state capability so that uh, governments could actually execute on their national ag investment plans and their flagships. Another pillar was the adoption and scaling of technology through program innovation. And the third pillar was partnerships. And I say this because the partnerships pillar was really, really new. And the, um, the work that we've been doing with African governments uh, on refining, improving, and measuring implementation of national agricultural investment plan strategies and flagships has really evolved and scaled significantly in the last four years. So there's been huge progress on policy changes but everyone knows those policy changes take many years to implement and then see the effect all the way to beneficiaries. So to your question about funding choices and you know who beneficiaries are and how does that become sustainable? One of the things that we have changed and through our partnerships programs has been matching um, investments. And we really hope to see that scaling up over the years going forward. And the matching that we really care about and that I think many of you care about is when governments are also investing where they say they're going to invest, right? So that matching of private sectors aligning to government investments and aligning to measurable and implementable success is really what uh, drives sustainability. 
I think a lot of people used to see sustainability as pure private sector funding, right? If the private sector goes in, then definitely it'd be sustainable. But you're all old enough to know, right, that even when you see a factory go up, it doesn't mean they'll run forever. A factory can shut down, can move, can go out of business. And how many empty factories do we know and have we seen? And so the, the, the struggle that we have all been seeing in, uh, across many countries on the continent is that the policy and the enabling environment has to be supportive of private sector growth and investment. So this is something that uh, the sustainability is really an equation, right? You have to have the private sector, you have to have the government support, and you have to have equitable and impactful beneficiaries who are inclusively benefiting, right? So you don't wanna just see commercial farmers benefiting, you wanna see women farmers benefiting, youth being more engaged, being employed. And sometimes those are a bit more costly than many people want to believe. So sustainability, and I think you see this also in the public, um, uh, publicly held companies, there's been a lot of change on measurement of ESG. We talk about ESG, environmental, uh, uh, and sustainable um, governance. How are companies measuring their own sustainability? I had a good friend who managed part of a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar business. And he used to say, you know, Vanessa, private sector is accessing limited commodities. You know, it, if you take a commodity like cashews or even soy, soy, everybody's scrambling to buy soy in Africa right now, right? And it's a limited commodity. It's not that widely available, even though it could be more, more and more planted and more consumed, it's very healthy, contributes to animal feed, contributes to vegetable oil, and yet people can't buy and can't produce enough soy. So I, I'm, I'm giving these examples to illustrate that really there's, there's a growth curve that Lloyd was describing that requires that productivity, investment, and policy all evolve and grow at the same pace. And so that can also contribute to sustainable growth and inclusive growth. So these are the things that, that we're looking to, to, to measure. Uh, people are talking about what is a, the, 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 the real minimum um, uh, uh, living standard, right? There's this $1.94 or whatever the World Bank uses to, to measure, right? Uh, what is the minimum amount that people can live off of? And everybody knows that amount is too small. Nobody can live off of $1.94 a day. So what is it, $5? What is it, $4, $10? You know, this is a conversation globally about minimal living standards. And for now, there have to be safety nets and legislative um, protections, which enable people really to meet those minimum standards. And so we across Africa should really have our own visibility to what we see as a minimum standard in each country. And there's a lot of interesting conversations coming out of food systems on living wages, on sustainable consumption, um, on proper labeling and packaging. So a lot of work to do, a lot of fun to be had. Uh, and um, again, you know, we hope to, to, to see all of this um, uh, energy, excitement, momentum translate into uh, last mile benefit and delivery on the ground. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Vanessa. Um, and also just uh, so I had some good points on, um, you know, matching of investments and, uh, you know, working of both the government and the private sector. And again, for the government, really investing uh, where they say uh, they will invest uh, to ensure sustainability. Uh, so I'd also like to ask that same question again to, uh, Dr. Francis Aminu, um, and from where you sit uh, for Dangote Foundation, uh, you know, how do you evaluate uh, the sustainability of a development program and what criteria do you uh, look to um, at to identify a beneficiary uh, before you could uh, get involved in uh, or rather you could give any funding to such a program? Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, beautiful question and uh, I listened to uh, Vanessa and quite interesting because this is something we always uh, take after because when you say evaluation it's after you've implemented the program that you come back to evaluate but for sustainability it's actually supposed to be rolled into the program even from the design stage 
That is why in the foundation, uh, rather than just having the evaluation, we have what we call monitoring and evaluation, accountability and learning, which is which means uh, acronym MEAL, M-E-A-L-L, -A -A -L, so which is MEAL. And in the MEAL, that means your essence of actually evaluating or monitor and evaluating um, is actually to ensure that you hold yourself accountable to the beneficiary who is our partner because we call our beneficiaries our partners as well so we need to actually uh, be able to give account to them and i always say that a caregiver or a farm family or in a household they have responsibility to be you know to the child that will have that kind of benefit at the end of the year from such a program. So our own meal follows the same pattern with other monitoring and evaluation kind of framework that we use, you know, where you need first and foremost to develop an evaluation blueprint, you know, but you find out that um, in most public institutions or even most donors, you hardly will see the monitoring and evaluation piece coming out, rather, is always an afterthought, like I said. So, but this really calls for having a blueprint that should be that should form part of the design of the overall program for sustainability. You need to lay a solid foundation by anticipating data collection needs because you need that, and that's where you must have some learnings that will lead to generating evidence. And that's why we have always been at pilot 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 because we have failed to generate a lot of evidences that we can use to say let's move ahead with whatever it is and reach out to uh, others and then make the kind of change we need and then we need for us to be able to do this too you need to design a comprehensive but focused data collection system and you need to keep pre-testing your data and then using them in collecting data not only at the end but at the beginning because you must have for you to be able to evaluate you must have a baseline data that you have to you know uh, collect and as you implement your program you stick to your plan and then be strategic and stay involved with your program and then one thing that we do and that's where the accountability and learning comes is to continually using the results again and again, you know, to fine tune the program until you scale up and then you move on with whatever program and then we reach to. And in this level, to get our partner, which I refer to as our beneficiaries, but to us, we call them our partners, um, they, which are the target group or the target beneficiaries of our program. First and foremost, the overall beneficiary for us is children under five uh, want to have. But for you, it's not just all children under five initially, but they come from an environment that will either uh, make them or mar them in terms of the well-being and then in terms of other issues. And because of funding constraints, at times you can't reach all, everyone. So we set up a kind of set of criteria we use to be able to do that. And generally, you know, in Africa, we have a kind of uh, 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 criteria that are tied into the dimensions of poverty because our criteria are such that they are, category, uh, they are categorized based on uh, dimensions, which is about 11 dimensions of poverty that we use to be able to ascertain which household will benefit from what we do. Because we look at the most vulnerable in the in the in the society, so I will just uh, take you uh, run through this without actually uh, being specific. Uh, like I said, we normally look at the issue of possession of goods and means of production. This is very very important. What people have, it could be livestock, it could be uh, tools for cultivation. They are home, they are shovel, they are all goods and means of production in their hands. And this is very, very important. And at times we are shocked 
to find out that in most farm families, they lack all this, you know, and which is very, very important. So household composition is very, very important. The income of the household too, you have to take into cognizance that the condition of their dwelling. I mean, when you look at their housing patterns, where they live, whether how it's been constructed, whether there is law or not. I mean, those uh, kind of part of overall uh, poverty dimensions that we look at. Then the occupation of the either the head of the household or the uh, whoever is the head of the household or other people in the household. You tend to look at their occupational status. We look at the issue of food security, and that is where I want to give a little bit of explanation, especially when we talk of malnutrition, which is one of our flagship. We have a program that is actually integrated nutrition program. And in this nutrition program, uh, the one of the set of criteria we use is severe acute malnutrition because, and when you get a child that is so, uh, presented with severe acute malnutrition, then if you can, go and, and reach out to the household, you find out that anything that is wrong in this world will be wrong with such household, with a child, with a severe acute malnutrition. And that has helped us to be able to reach out with the issue of water and sanitation to such household, the issue of uh, food security of the household being met, the issue of economic uh, income of the household through a kind of uh, uh, social uh, protection interventions or cash-based intervention, or those possess uh, goods and means of production that we can make accessible for them uh, to be able to do that. Then we talk of the uh, health status too, which is very, very important, and the education that they have. The foundation actually has four pillar of four pillars of uh, its own uh, uh, kind of policy thrust. Uh, which has to do with health and nutrition, uh, has to do with education, economic empowerment, and overall empowerment and humanitarian. So health status of the household is very, very important. The education of the household, the access to basic services and to credit will profile all these. For a child that is having uh, severe acute malnutrition, then will give us this kind of dimensions of poverty. and to qualify them to that uh, kind of program. And for sustainability, if you have such households coming out of the whole situation of severe acute malnutrition, poverty, and the rest, they have become advocate to actually work with other members of the community to be able to uh, make a lot of changes. In, and, and, and in all these two, we have a lot of technology being deployed, especially in granting them access to those basic services and to credit facility, you know, uh, and, and you know, uh, ramification. So these are the things we uh, have as indicators that we use eventually, not only for selecting them, even for evaluating the program and then the sustainability at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Aminu. Uh, very important points about uh, proactively developing an evaluation blueprint that guides the framework for the program and also holding yourself accountable to your partners who are basically your beneficiaries. Uh, thank you for uh, that input, uh, Dr. Minu. Uh, so uh, next I would like to engage uh, Mr. Lloyd Lipage. Um, so uh, Lloyd, uh, evidence-based technology for market production, finance and knowledge flows to open up, will uh, open up uh, new avenues for the transformation of and modernization of nutritional and agricultural value chains. Uh, so, Mr. Lloyd, where do you think the influx of agricultural investments will be focused on in the coming years? Yeah, so thanks, Christian, uh, for that. Uh, I think it's a very important question because we believe that, you know, investment uh, strategic investment can really open up uh, the doors for, for this acceleration that we've been talking about. COVID has really exposed the need to manage fresh produce more effectively and with better shelf life. Uh, a lot of the, the work and the research that's been going on also in preparation for the food summit is looking at much more diverse crops. 
Um, at the same time, there is changing market dynamics. Um, these were already in place before COVID uh, and which are now even more important now than ever. So you have, for example, the next billion people on the planet uh, will be in Africa. Uh, most of those will be living in urban areas. Uh, already you have in some countries in Africa, more than 50% of the population living in urban areas. Ghana would be an example of that. Uh, these will be youth, young, young people uh, looking for a different way of life, uh, looking at uh, more diverse crops, easier to, to use uh, foods, uh, you know, you know, higher end uh, products, uh, which has both, you know, positive and negative uh, uh, consequences, including, you know, fast foods and, uh, and more uh, fatty products, uh, more meats, more easy to use products. And then also you have a more affluent society. So um, Africa, the, the rise of the middle income, um, and, and even at the lowest levels, there is, uh, you know, an increase in, in incomes. We talk about, you know, yes, there is an increasing amount of poverty, that's true, and, and hunger, uh, but that's also on the back of a, a much more rapid and growing population. So not only is there a need for more grains and staple crops to provide food and feedstock for, for example, the meat industry and for uh, other livestock industry, but there's an urgent need to now invest in healthier, more nutritious, more efficient, and more diverse food and beverage uh, baskets so that that urban, that increasingly urban population, uh, you know, can move away from a reliance on imports into local uh, productions that, that, are, that are just within their back door. Um, at the same time, there's also increasing recognition that bio-based economy opportunities exist. For example, you've got cotton, uh, not only for its textile industry, but also for for byproducts coming from cotton, you've got bamboo industry, hemp, uh, sisal, and even sugar as a feedstock for industrial products. And also increasingly plant-based therapies and nutritional additives. Uh, those all provide you know, income uh, and investment opportunities. But at the same time, these need to be both environmentally conscious and climate smart. So this in the back of, uh, of those, um, and also provide opportunities not only for large farmers, um, but also for all farmers to make a sustained and meaningful income as we've talked about already. What this means is that agriculture and food investment opportunities abound, and there's never been a better time to invest in African agriculture and food systems, particularly in light of the new continental free trade area, uh, where products can be moved from areas of excess to areas of deficit. Governments we work with are already taking many of the first risks um, there's, there's an extremely uh, important amount of investment going into agri-infrastructure, um, both by governments themselves and also indirectly with, with um, developed finance institutions. Uh, these include things like special agro-processing zones, economic zones, market and logistics infrastructure, irrigation schemes, schemes uh, development corridors, and, and border crossings and ports. So now it's really up to, again, to the private sector to seize on that opportunity and, and bring in the investment to partner with those African governments and the private sector in these countries and, and the communities as well to make sure that they don't get left behind and to create that shared economic value and growth um, through investment. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, very uh important points about uh, strategic investments uh, which will accelerate the developments we're talking about and having uh, both the private sector and also government involved in this making this make, making these investments uh, so next i'll uh, go to you uh, victor uh, so nourishing africa is a home to for one million agri-food entrepreneurs transforming africa's digital landscape do you agree that the future of food and agriculture landscape holds significant potential not just because of the size of the market but also because the continent naturally endowed for natural excellence over to you victor 
Um, th thank you so much, uh, Kristen, for that. Um, and, and then this gives me an opportunity to speak about uh, what we do in Nourishing Africa and, and what I think about um, the agricultural landscape, especially in terms of uh, agri SMEs, um, uh, those who do agriculture as a business. Um, so one thing that I would really want to uh, put across is uh, there's a definitely a need for moving farms into farms. I mean, uh, farms with F-A-R-M-S to farms in F-I-R-M-S, um, such that uh, these um, agricultural enterprises can become more professional in the way they uh, undertake their, uh, their agribusinesses. Um, there are some simple little things that they need to uh, implement in their um, uh, agribusinesses so that they can be able to reach uh, to this scale uh, and to reach to this level. Something as simple as record keeping can be the difference between whether an agribusiness is able to acquire funding from a bank or not. And so uh, it's really important that um, the agribusinesses that are there can get the skill and they can get uh, capacity building, they can get the information that they require so that they can turn their farms uh, into, into farms. And what we've seen is an explosion of agribusiness across the continent. Um, there are very many people who are now um, uh, working uh, towards um, doing agriculture as a business, uh, more than just a, a hobby or something uh, as a solitary uh, exercise uh, to survive. Uh, so uh, with that kind of transition, then uh, then there needs to be the requisite uh, scaling of um, uh, the kind of support that they require. Uh, and so that's where Nourishing uh, Africa comes in, because uh, we could see that um, about 70% of all agriculture uh, passes through private operations. And, and so these are the agricultural enterprises that really uh, keep the agricultural uh, food system uh, in Africa moving. Uh, and so then how can we provide the structures of support? And, and we've seen this especially from uh, a digital perspective because we are a digital uh, agriculture hub. Uh, we are a, a digital um, uh, system where we uh, bring together agri-food entrepreneurs from across the continent. Uh, so we have about 1,250 uh, agripreneurs in our uh, digital hub. Uh, and then the first thing that you will see is first the connection that there is. Um, we see a lot of fragmentation, especially in the agri SMEs. Uh, they do not have a connection with each other. There's no sharing of best practices. Um, there's no sharing of country experiences. Uh, but by bringing um, all these agri-food entrepreneurs uh, in one platform, then they can be able to connect with each other, share best practices, um, uh, and also be able to learn from each other. But we've seen that uh, co-creation uh, of solutions coming out of, of the discussions that they have in that platform. Um, then the second thing that we noticed is um, then with just uh, the digital platforms will not just connect these agreed entrepreneurs. Then it will also go an extra mile to provide the structures of support uh, so that they can continue to grow. Um, and so what we've seen in this uh, regard is um, the provision of uh, things uh, as capacity building. Um, what is the information that they require to move from uh, a startup uh, to growth and, and even to sustainability? And because that is the kind of trajectory that um, these agri food SMEs uh, need to take. Um, so we have a lot of capacity building programs. Um, and we have seen even uh, this uh, really uh, increasing um, uh, the sustainability of agribusinesses. Agri and we've seen these agribusinesses now be able to move up uh, to growth and scale. Uh, the other thing that I will say is access to funding, which we have noticed is a great challenge uh, across the continent. Um, and agri-food SMEs really uh, keep saying that there's no uh, there are no funds uh, for, for them to access. Um, the banks say that uh, the agri SMEs are too risky to invest in. Um, then we can see investors who are saying that there are no bankable agri SMEs uh, that they can be able to invest in. And so we can see everyone throwing the blame game to each other. Um, uh, but what about uh, a situation where we can bring all these uh, facets together um, uh, and ensure that these agri SMEs are bankable and we can be able to create a bankable uh, pipeline of agri SMEs that investors can look at, uh, at uh, be able to uh, provide business advisory services uh, to these agri SMEs so that they can become, um, uh, 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 they can be able to receive credit and they can become credit worthy. Um, and, and so we've seen these uh, things really work very well 
uh, from our own perspective from nourishing Africa. And so our aim really uh, going into the future is to be a hub um, for about 1 million agri food SMEs where they can come and get the structures of support, get connected to each other across the continent, uh, and then we can create a vibrant um, and a dynamic uh, ecosystem for them to continue to grow. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much. Um, and you know, uh, stress out uh, more than you have. Uh, so talking about the way we need to move uh, from just uh, farmers to agripreneurs, and also for transform the from just producers to agri businesses, and also how do we support and connect uh, agri SMEs to all the other relevant in the ecosystem, for example, access to inputs and finance. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Victor, for that. Um, and our panelist, uh, Vanessa, uh, we want to excuse herself. So I'll invite Vanessa to give her closing remarks uh, before we could uh, continue with the rest of the session. Welcome, Vanessa. Closing remarks. Basically, I want to appreciate all of the participants on this um, webinar and all of you because the conversations have been intensive, have been frequent. Um, we have, uh, as I, I heard from everybody, a momentum that's building across countries, across stakeholders, and across the continent. And it's really critical, in my view, um, that we're very strict in, in, our, in our measurement and our um, engagements. A lot of temptation is, is around to double count contributions and partnerships, which we don't see as really benefiting the landscape. Um, and, and yet, um, the need is great, but we want to show progress. And as I said in the beginning, the reputation on the continent of what Africa has been able to achieve is critical. Um, and at the same time, there is a, a growing um, urgency around hunger and malnutrition that can't be ignored. So how do we have that cognitive dissonance, which is holding conflicting information at the same time in our minds in the way we tell the story? Yes, we're positive. Yes, we're making progress. And yes, there is growing climate risk. And yes, there is a growing volatility. And yes, at the same time, um, complexity is terrifying people. We don't know if we can actually manage to that complexity. And that is the reality on the ground. And so the better we are at explaining that complexity and showing that in the end, um, the, the intention, the willingness, the desire to adopt technology, make the changes, um, and actually show uh, that there are opportunities for growth. And this is so important. And we're seeing um, uh, improved accessibility to mechanization, to, to um, Cold storage, for example, we've talked about cold storage for you know decades, but we see now um, you know container-sized cold storage, um, solar energy for food processing, um, more labs for testing, uh, improved quality of, of what can be delivered and verification, uh, even harmonization of standards, um, which are prerequisites to increasing trade. So um, and and willingness uh, of the global um, corporations to actually uh, capture um, and deliver through not just their sustainability activities but through their core businesses sourcing where they can from small departments whether it be breweries and sorghum um, as Lloyd was talking about poultry feed or, or fish feed and, and growing opportunities um, there and so uh, I, I do see acceleration acceleration of, uh, of improved um, technology and uh, adoption of those technologies. Um, but I think that um, the consumers and the investors, the, the educated middle-class Africans investing in their own landscape is also critical, right? We don't want to just see a brain drain. We don't want to just see a, a capital drain going outside of the continent. We want to see people seeing opportunities and reinvesting themselves in their own countries. Not only for CSNR, not for just you know social purposes and reasons, not out of obligation, but because it makes business sense. And that's really what I, I see as um, the way forward. And I hope that we're going to see a plethora of African investment funds and, um, in, in, and mutualization of risk mitigation across the continent. So. Um, 
Uh, we've already seen uh, w recently a recent uh, almost a billion dollar fund just for investing in Africa, uh, which was oversubscribed. And so I think there's there's really um, a, quite a momentum to work with, and, and we look forward to continuing on this journey. And let's report back together. We say next year in Rwanda, right, Lloyd, at uh, AJRF in Kigali. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you very much for your participation, for your input, and looking forward to engaging you in future sessions uh, as part of this conversation and any other forums uh, that uh, will allow us to reconvene together. Thank you very much, uh, Vanessa. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And so uh, thank you for uh, to our panelists for your in inputs, for your insights, uh, very good conversations happening. Um, so I would want us to prepare uh, for the Q&A session. Uh, so to our participants, uh, kindly, if you have any, any questions, uh, please type it uh, on the chat uh, so that you can be able to pick it up and we can be able to uh, address it. Uh, so before we can move to the Q&A session, uh, I would want uh, to do another a quick poll uh, for participants, uh, which is about um, what solutions you would be interested in to ensure business uh, continuity and growth during uh, disruptions like uh, we saw uh, for COVID, for example. So if you could kindly go to, uh, to the poll, uh, we'd like to know uh, from where you sit from your organization as an individual, what solutions would you be interested in to ensure that uh, you achieve business continuity and growth uh, during uh, you know, disruptions that are you know, happening in the market. Uh, for example, uh, you know, uh, disruptions being caused by, uh, by COVID or any other disruptions uh, which are really beyond our control. Uh, so we want to, you to just select uh, one of those uh, answers that you've given there, whether it's uh, climate smart agriculture, sustainability of programs, traceability for food security, um, and uh, farm product uh, productivity. So as we wait for the, uh, for the participants to, to give in their input, I would want to uh, quickly jump into some of the questions that have already been typed in the, in the, on the chat. So we have a question uh, from, uh, So from uh, Tumaini Kenge, where uh, he's asking about uh, whether we have any specific example, uh, story or experience model of the approach in which ICT is working successfully in East Africa. And I would uh, confidently say yes, uh, we have quite a number of uh, programs uh, that uh, we, we participated in uh, and not just crop in, but also other technologies. I'll probably give an example of um, uh, Ethiopia, where we've been a part of a larger consortium that has been working with the Agricultural, Agricultural Transformation Agency, where they want to move uh, their farmers from just being subsistence farmers to uh, commercial farmers. So what they are doing is uh, they are organizing their farmers into farmer groups, and they have also adopted technology to make sure that uh, they are able to give timely extension advisors, advisory services. They're able to track uh, things like uh, input distribution. They have also incorporated things like uh, mechanization. And now these farmers are now slowly moving from just uh, having a small uh, two acre farm, for example, which is just for feeding you and your family. But uh, they're able to produce, uh, by use of this technology, they're able to produce enough food to feed uh, themselves and their families. Then from there, uh, they're able to sell the surplus to the market. So they have now been transformed from just being smallholder farmers, uh, doing subsistence farming, but also being able to slowly move uh, to become commercial farmers as well. Uh, uh, the other question, I hope uh, your question has been adequately answered in case you have any uh, question uh, or other further clarification, you can still type on the chat. Uh, so the other question is about access to finance. Access to finance is a, is a major issue um, as uh, interest rates are high in Kenya, and not just in Kenya, uh, but also across uh, Africa. So how then do we uh, enable uh, these farmers to get access to finance? And I'll probably 
uh, shoot this question to Victor because uh, he had mentioned something about uh, connecting the agri, agri SMEs and the farmers to the different eco players. And I would probably uh, uh, push this question to Victor just to give his uh, inputs on how um, we can be able to enable and uh, empower access to finance for, for farmers. Ah, thanks so much uh, for, for, for that uh, uh, question uh, about finance in, 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 in agriculture and how we can be able to uh, scale that smallholder farmers can be able to get uh, finance. So the first thing that I think we need to do um, is to capacity build uh, smallholder farmers and agribusinesses as well. Um, so there are some requisites uh, that banking, uh, banking institutions, financial institutions uh, have and, and so uh, without that kind of knowledge, then farmers will continue uh, using uh, and not being able to get uh, 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 this kind of finance. And, and so it is really critical that we uh, train our farmers, that we speak to our farmers, that they get the business advisory so that they can get that requisite information and they can be able to implement them uh, in their farms and farms so that they can be able to um, get there. So um, there's so much information that is available and, and that uh, is required for farmers so that they can be able to um, uh, get the requisite uh, capacities and competencies and also uh, so that they can meet the criteria for finance. Uh, I think the second thing we will need, we need to do uh, on financing is uh, to sensitize uh, our um, financial institutions. Uh, we have seen really that financial institutions think that agriculture is risky. Um, and so what we need to do is to de-risk agriculture so that we can be able to uh, uh, provide uh, um, the requisite financing uh, for uh, them to continue to grow. And one of these ways is climate smart agriculture because uh, climate change really is one of the greatest challenges that smallholder farmers face. Um, if uh, farmers can be able to implement climate smart agriculture, then we can see that farmers can be de-risked uh, and they can be able to get financing even uh, better. Uh, and we've seen this, uh, especially, uh, I've seen this from the Alliance of Bevacity International and CIET, uh, that have been working with smallholder farmers to increase climate smart agriculture and the adoption of climate smart agriculture. Um, we, we've seen this really working great for smallholder farmers who are implementing um, climate smart agriculture, knowing when it's going to rain, when, knowing which kind of seed variety that they need to, to, to plant. And, and this, uh, so this kind of uh, climate smart technologies, uh, climate smart management practices help to de-risk um, uh, smallholder farmers and they can be able to get uh, uh, access to, to funding. And, and lastly, I think there's a really great need for innovation in the sector. And I think blended finance could play a great role uh, in this. So blended finance, uh, where you can use uh, a combination on um, where development finance is used as a catalyst to increase uh, uh, private sector financing uh, for smallholder farmers. Um, in this regard, I have seen, uh, for example, um, uh, Agra has been able to do this. A few other organizations have been able to do this, um, where uh, development finance has been used to uh, remove some of the market uh, challenges and operational challenges um, and um, that we then then uh, sm uh, smallholder farmers can be able to get um, financing from private sectors let, let me just give an example of this um, uh, we've seen especially guarantees work as very great uh, for financial institutions if a financial institution is told that they will get a guarantee uh, for every credit that they are able to provide uh, to uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, then we can see this working really great and smallholder farmers and financial institutions then do not have a problem to uh, lend uh, to smallholder farmers. So I think there's really a great need for uh, innovation. So I think those three things will really enable us to uh, access um, uh, smallholder farmers, uh, increase smallholder farmers access uh, to uh, finance. Thank you, Victor, for that comprehensive uh, uh, answer. So my next question uh, will be to you, uh, uh, Lloyd. Uh, it's about, so we have a question from uh, Oludayo Satonwa, where he's asking, when will the average farmer feel the impact of ICT, knowing that the rural ones lack electricity uh, and access to power and equipment uh, and access to funding is almost zero? Uh, so I know, Louis, you are working a lot with government, and some of these are the challenges, some of the challenges that uh, you're going to advise the government to solve. Uh, so basically, what uh, Mr. Oludao wants to know: What will the average farmer be able to 
enjoy the benefits of uh, technology in agriculture. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I would like to maybe add a comment also to the financing question and maybe then get into, into that. Um, I think we shouldn't underestimate the uh, power of, of aggregation of the, the farmer group. So farm-based organizations as a financing vehicle um, are extremely important. And, and I think, again, you know, innovative partnerships between, for example, cooperatives, you know, farm-based uh, organizations, uh, dealers or, or distributors, uh, government and, and commercial banks uh there is a way to de-risk um, a lot of that investment you know nobody knows the farmer better than the, than the one who actually serves him right away that the, the, the direct what we used to call in the private sector s1 uh the one who is just one step away from the farmer and sometimes that's a cooperative sometimes that's a dealer sometimes it's a it's a buyer um and empowering those uh those those enterprises to be also part of the financing solution, uh, I think, you know, goes some way to address not only the finance question, but also the, the question that was just asked about access to ICTs, um, also to be able to provide that access to the services uh, such as ICTs at an aggregate level. So, for example, a village-based uh, information service that might be able to provide access to to multiple farmers uh, could be run by a young entrepreneur could provide finances could could also uh, link to buyer networks and and provide logistics um, so many of the services in kenya for example we see uh, an extensive uh, contract mechanization provider network um, these are all empowered by ICT tools and, and access by the farmers who are the ultimate beneficiaries, you know, is really through these other um, enterprises that surround the farmer and, and can aggregate uh, at the smallholder farmer level. So uh, many times, you know, that means empowering and, and providing better education to uh, cooperatives um, to become a producer company in their own right. Uh, professionally managed, professionally serviced, and also bankable uh, in their own right and providing those services to customers. So I'm trying to answer both questions at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank you a lot for that. Uh, so my last question would be to Dr. Aminu. I uh, will probably just have two questions for this uh, uh, doctor. Uh, so the question is from uh, Mr. Wolabi in Nigeria. He wants to know what is the contribution of the Ambote Foundation to agricultural products to grow materials, processing, storage, and production in Nigeria, most especially in the northern part of Nigeria. Over to you, Professor uh, Samin. Thank you. That's a very laudable question. And uh, looking at uh, the northern part of Nigeria, we know how difficult the Sahelian region is and the livelihood of the people. Uh, and I think one thing that uh, uh, our benefactor, who is Alaji Ali Kodangote, with his uh, group, what he's doing is to ensure that there is kind of uh, uh, kind of uh, grower uh, kind of system where you have uh, the farmers being aggregated uh, to actually, you know, uh, go into production. For instance, tomato, an industry was cited in in, in such a, a kind of a region. And his goal initially was that every state of the federation, wherever you are, look at your raw materials, the local uh, materials and resources, agricultural produce, is willing to cite an industry to be able to take up immediately from there. Uh, but you could still realize that, yes, there are a lot of challenges uh, because he aggregated them and then they are now producing. But you find out that uh, external kind of uh, agents like the middlemen will come from somewhere else and offer them more prices, you know, for those produce. And then they are now willing to sell, you know, even just outside that of the, uh, the group. And then the group is now poised and forced to now produ uh, produce its own uh, products, you know, raw materials itself, you know, around that same locality. But again, they are all contributing to the overall uh, 
uh, food and nutrition security in that environment. But the arrangement, which is more like backward integration, is still working in some instances, some states. But again, what we are doing in the uh, ADFIN program, which is a liquid and good foundation integrated nutrition program, is to have these farmers, uh, especially starting from those with household with problems, you know, uh, looking into their livelihood and then now producing and even setting some of them up for some of the local nutritious foods that are required to feed these children. And then they could be involved with the production. So that's the plan we eventually have at that level where you can have a community effort, you know, like women's group coming together to produce, you know, uh, the combination of uh, series and uh, 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 and there's legumes together to form the nutritious foods that are needed to treat um, uh, mild to moderate uh, uh, acute malnutrition. And then but for those with severe acute malnutrition, we're providing uh, RUTF, which is ready to use therapeutic foods at the health centers, while we are rehabilitating the health centers as well to be able to accommodate them. But for the small farmers, uh, groups, they come together in aggregate and then they are provided with the seed, the inputs uh, such as the seed and then some credit facility to be able to produce. Then they have a ready-made market in the factory that will now process this further, thereby reducing waste and then um, that are really associated with the food production and processing in Nigeria. I hope I answered some of the um, questions, if not all. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Dr. Aminu, thank you very much. So at this point, I would really like to uh, thank our participants and also our panelists. So I would want to give a uh, 30 seconds uh, opportunity for each of our panelists to give uh, their closing remarks. So I'll start with you, Lloyd Halipage. I could just kindly uh, quickly give us uh, closing remarks, uh, 30 seconds, uh, so that we uh, stick to our time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and, and really appreciate this opportunity. You know, for the last uh, 30 years, uh, in the beginning, we've been talking about feeding Africa. Um, then more recently, thankfully, uh, it's been more about Africa feeding itself. But I think when we look forward, when we look uh, at, at the opportunities ahead of us, it's really about uh, Africa not only feeding itself, but also getting to the point where it can become uh, capable of feeding the world. It is the future and it has the opportunity to be able to do that. And I'm very excited uh, by the caliber of people that we see in the panel today uh, and, and those many, many people that have been working in this space for, for many years. And uh, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Lloyd. Really appreciate uh, your inputs and your insights. Uh, so over to you, Victor, if you can kindly give us your closing remarks. Uh, thanks, uh, Kristen, uh, for, for, for this. Um, first, I, I'm really encouraged by an African proverb that says that uh, once a village comes together, then they can even mend a crack in the sky. Um, so our food systems really are quite broken. Uh, they are broken for our health. Um, they are broken because for our environment. Uh, they are broken for the youth. They are broken for um, sustainability. Our food systems really are... Uh, Precarious at a precarious state uh, right now, and so there's need to uh, make sure that we can be able to transform our food systems. Uh, but I'm encouraged uh, to see that there's now people coming together. There's cooperation. There's galvanizing of ideas. There's um, great partnerships, um, and that we can be able to move now from the pilots that we've been speaking about to the kind of scale that we want to see. Uh, and so we need some kind of urgency to move there. And I, I, I see great momentum in, in, in us achieving this, and hopefully we will get there. Thank you, Victor. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Francis Amino, if you could also give us your closing remarks as well. Thank you. Uh, I would like to close uh, my, make my closing remarks to reiterate what a liquid and good foundation stands for, uh, which is an Africa that is, uh, um, headier, an African that's uh, more educated, an Africa that's more empower, empowered uh, to be able to carry uh, a lot of uh, things by itself. Uh, the paradigm shift that we are having is to have Africa 
that should be able to help Africans. And then by so doing, helping the whole world, you know, at the end of the day. But again, from this meeting, I've just gathered too that extending the use of ICTs to poorer people uh, actually requires investment in the rural areas where the poor and the hungry people really live. We need to consider this, but not just for them to live in ICTs, but in basic infrastructure. Uh, we want them in social services and in policies that support inclusive rural communities and then sustainable agriculture. Without this investment, uh, young people with no hope at home will continue to migrate from villages to overcrowded cities and urban centers and beyond. I think it's really the time to do that is now. Thank you so much and God bless you all for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aminu. Really appreciate your input and your insights. Uh, so on behalf of uh, uh, Cropping and the other organizers for this uh, webinar, I would like to thank our panelists, uh, our participants, my colleagues uh, for making this uh, event a success. And I'm really looking forward to the next uh, discussion and let's continue having the conversation. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your time. Sorry, we've gone over about by three minutes, uh, but it was worth it. It was a really a good uh, and engaging discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Reimagining agriculture with data.